Uh, I can start? Okay, cool. All right. Um, we'll begin if everyone has their pizza. I am recycling a talk that I gave yesterday, so sorry. Um, Matthew up here will also be jumping in maybe at some point. Um, this is a talk about Camly Store. I'm Brad Fitzpatrick. I work at Google, not at this office, but um, this is kind of my side project that I've been working on for about six years when I'm not um, actually working on Go. I work on the Go programming language, and this is all written in Go, um, but that's not really the purpose of this talk. So the website says that Camly Store is a system to store, sync, share, model, and backup content, so we'll talk about a little bit of all those briefly. But first I want to tell a little story about this crappy little table. Um, I'm moving into a new place and we had no living room table. We wanted to play some games and this was for Thanksgiving and everyone was there and we wanted to have a table but we didn't want to go buy one because we had, you know, opinions on what a table should be. So instead we went to the store, got some lumber, got a circular saw, uh, brought the lumber and the circular saw to my house, we produced a table, put it Um, oh, yeah, this is a list of all the sites that have died over time. Um, it's actually kind of depressing. You've probably been impacted by some of these, but it just goes on and on and on and on of sites that are shut down and all the data lost. So I wanted to do something about this. So Camly Store notably is personal. It's about your stuff. It's like your personal life vault of everything. You can think of it, if you want, as your, you know, your Gmail corpus, but instead of just the email, it's everything in your life. Or, you know, a giant Git repo for your entire life that's totally private that just grows. There's no delete operation. You just keep adding stuff to it and you can find it later. Uh, and it's, you know, for life, it's supposed to be very survivable and it cares a lot about data, data archaeology and self-describing and stuff like this. So future generations should be able to figure it out. So we'll go over some of these. Uh, first of all, storing data. Oh, and the acronym, by the way, is Content Addressable Multi-Level Index Storage. It was supposed to be a temporary name. Um, we haven't found a better name yet. But it's Content Addressable, which we'll talk about more in storage. There's multiple layers. We'll show you kind of a diagram of all the stuff. There's some very simple layers on the base and some very advanced layers on the top. So storage. Um, at the base, uh, Camly Store is Content Addressable. Every little chunk of data, every little chunk of your files, if you're storing files, every little chunk of your tweets, or all your metadata is also blobs. Everything at the base layer is just content addressable blobs. So this example, I'm echoing the five bytes hello into Camput, and I'm putting a blob, and it gives me back a blob ref. This is like a handle to this piece of data, which just represents these five bytes. There's no metadata, there's no permissions, there's no content type, it's really just those five bytes hello and there's no meaning about what those are. Likewise, you know, you're putting in world, and we can enumerate all the blobs on our server. We have two blobs, and you could get them back out and see that you got hello in world. So at the base layer, all Camly Store can do is store content addressable things. This means deduping is free, because if you put in hello multiple times, you will always get the same SHA-1 or SHA-256 or SHA-512. Um, Camly Store is designed to withstand upgrades to hash functions over time as they get broken. So today we can use SHA-1. Tomorrow, actually in the next release, we'll be switching to uh, SHA-256.
basically all it can do is get a blob, put a blob, and enumerate your blobs. Um, so we have implementations for just about everything. There's three implementations that can store things on disk in different ways. Um, either one blob per file is the most naive implementation. Um, there's also one that packs it, and there's one that kind of packs it by locality of access. You can also store it on Amazon or Google Cloud Storage or Mongo or basically anything that can um, store cloud file sort of things. There's also a whole bunch of ones down here that are lowercase that can do various wrap other ones. So you could do like sharding or unioning or routing or different namespaces so you can see isolated views of the data. You can encrypt on top of one. So you can have an encrypting layer that encrypts your blobs before you put it on S3 or before you put it on your friend's computer. Uh, caching one so you can like have a subset of your data locally fast on your laptop, but you fault in on demand things that you don't have on your laptop from S3, maybe encrypted or whatever. Um, and can we start about syncing this? So of course, all this stuff you can route around to like whatever configuration you want. There's some popular configurations that we make easier for you out of the box. But if you want to wire this up in some bizarro configuration, it supports basically whatever. So this is very easy to sync because there's no versions of a blob. If you have five bytes hello, it is the only version that can ever exist. So it's very easy to like, you know, if you have 80% of your data here and 60% of your data there, you know there's some overlap, but you don't know what, it doesn't matter. You just say copy everything. You're not going to be wasting any space because it's all deduped. So content addressable at the base layer makes a lot of things really easy. It makes syncing really easy. It makes deduping really easy. But content addressable stuff isn't really easy to work with at higher levels. So. As a little aside, I have a coworker who has a really bizarre uh, Camly store configuration. He has a kind of vacation home out in the woods with a terrible, terrible DSL connection. And he, it's kind of an internet connection, but not really. So he can talk. He wants to do offsite backup. He doesn't want offsite. He doesn't want to backup to the cloud because he thinks it's too expensive. So instead, he has one instance at home, and he has one instance out in the woods. And they can talk to each other enough to like say hello and talk about what blobs they have, but the connection is so poor bandwidth-wise that when he ever visits his vacation place, he uses Camly Store to ask the other side, which blobs don't you have that I have? And then he uses Camly Store again to write all those blobs to a disk. Then he flies with the disk, sneaker nets it, and then he dumps all those blobs into the other server. So he lazily synchronizes them as he travels back and forth. So Camly Store supports this. It's a real world application, indeed. And Camly Store also supports syncing from the outside world. So if you use uh, third party tools, you know, Foursquare or Swarm or Twitter or whatever, we slurp in your content and we like run importers, convert it into Camly Store schema, and, you know, let you view it and search it there. So this is a screenshot of my instance as of uh, yesterday. And you can see that I have like Foursquare check ins or Swarm check ins, I have tweets, I have photos. If I actually just uh, go switch over to my live instance now, you can see this is a little hack fest that we were doing right before this. You can see last night um, some check-ins, bike plays, and edas, and you can see tweets I just made 63 minutes ago. Look, we have good internet here, so I don't need screenshots. They're easy. Um, Camo Store also has to have a way to model all this stuff because you know you saw that there's tweets and there's photos and there's check-ins and files. So remember again that Camly Store only stores these immutable content address blobs. But Camly Store is not like file specific or anything. A POSIX file with you know bytes and Unix modes and permissions and all the stuff is just one thing that you can model in Camly Store. So if you wanted to make a file called hello.txt and it had the contents hello world, book that's readable, you can say camp put file and put that file in. But the handle you get back out, the blob ref, isn't just the bytes hello world. It's actually metadata. In this case, it's, it's all JSON metadata. And it says that it's this is a schema blob. Camly version 1 it's of type file. The file name is hello.txt. Here are the parts. This is the root of a Merkle tree. So this could be like a five terabyte file that's all chunked, you know, like recursively down. And it does like the whole rolling checksum thing. So if you have a five terabyte file and you like prepend a byte, and you upload it again, it won't upload another five terabytes. It'll just find some, it'll find some unique cut points and only update like the beginning and the end of the file. So it's good for like you can up, put a, like a VM image in here and use your VM for a little bit and write some random blocks around or upload a database. It, if you take your database dump and you put it in there again, you won't be uploading all the content again. 
So if we can get out this one chunk, this file only has one chunk and it's 13 bytes, you can get out the original bytes of the file. So we have tools to make all this easy. You can fuse mount this and use it like, like you know a Dropbox, like a normal file system. I'll show you a demo of that in a little bit here. Or you could, of course, put a directory in there. So a directory is just another thing you can model. It has entries, and the entries is a static set type. It has numbers, and those numbers are files, and it's directories and files and bytes and chunks all the way down until you actually get to what you care about. So this is kind of boring in a way, plus 60 files. So let's talk about how do we represent more interesting things like a tweet or a little to-do note or some something mutable, because everything content addressable is immutable. It, its name is you know, it's a function of the fixed bytes. So if we want to do something that we can mutate, we have a concept called permanodes. And a permanode is just a random number, basically, that's signed. So if you use the command line tools, there's ways to do this, not command line tools, but every time you put a permanode, you get a new random identifier, and a new blob ref. And if you look at it, all it is is a JSON schema blob that's a random number, but then it's signed. And then you see this field here, Camly signer. And that signer is another blob ref. But if you look at that blob ref, it's an uh, open PGB identity. So in Camly store, there's some blobs that are chunks of data that are unsigned. There's some schema blobs that represent like models of data that are unsigned, because they're not like subjective statements. They're just like a description of the data that's objectively true. This is exactly what you know a POSIX file called a.txt with this content would be. And then there's claims or ownership of things. So permanos are owned by whoever signed them. And all mutations that come off of them, we'll talk about mutations actually right now. Um, so what we can do is make a permanode here. We call it x. And we can put attributes on the permanode. And each one of these is a, a mutation claim. And it's itself assigned to JSON. And you basically keep this log of mutations for every permanode about what you want it to be. So here we set the title of this new node Think of a permanent as just a thing, a thing we want to store. So we have a thing called X, and we set the title to some title. And then we think of a better title, so we call it better title. And now we can ask Camly Store to describe X, and the search and indexing system come back and says, well, it's a permanent, and the current attributes as of this modification time is better title. So you might think, you know, well, what if I screwed that up and I wanted to get back to some title? Nothing's lost. You can look at claims and see the mutation log of X. And you can see that this time, this claim uh, from this signer modified this subject, this permanent, and did a, it was a claim of type set attribute. You can add attributes, you could delete attributes, and set it to some title. This one set it to better title. And when you query the search system, you could actually say, oh, describe and tell me what it looked like at this point. You can do all this with Fuse, too. So you can look at your file system as it existed at any point in time. It's like constantly snapshotting. Now, if we go back and like round on our server now, we say cam tool list and enumerate all the blobs. At this point, we have some of these are permanodes, some of these are data chunks, some of these are schema chunks representing files, some of these are claims or mutations. Um, but at this level, it doesn't know any of this crap. It's just a bunch of blobs and can enumerate them. So this is the job of the next layer up to make sense of all this. So that's the point of like searching and indexing it. So architecturally, it kind of looks like this. The, there's a blob storage that just does the content address we'll get input. Um, the indexer makes sense of all this and like puts it in sorted string tables so you can scan it efficiently and like know what parts are what. Part of that is verifying claims to make sure that they're not forged and you can't, you know, if you cause somebody else to download something, you can't make them download a claim that tricks your indexer into doing something else. Then there's a search system on top of that, and an API that lets you like query the claims and make add things and make uh, make new claims. And then on top of that, we have the web UI, which you saw briefly. We have the Fuse file system, the command line tools, various importers like slurping in from Foursquare and you know Twitter and stuff, and various apps. So the indexing is just another interface, just like we had that one for storage of blobs that was get and put of a content addressable ref. Key value is an interface that just adding a string and a string, a key value string. And you can look them up by, by key. You can set it by key. You can set a whole batch atomically, or you can enumerate them in sorted order. And so on top of this, well, so this is the base interface. And then, of course, we have implementations for everything. So if it can sort strings and enumerate them, 
which is like any SQL database or any sort of cloudy key value stored Dynamo or whatever, um, you can use your use the Camel Short Index on top of it. And the index doesn't matter if you lose it, if it's on your laptop and you drop your laptop or something, but all your real blobs are somewhere reliable, it doesn't matter because you can always rebuild your index from the raw blob. So really all you have to worry about is keeping your blob safe and duplicated everywhere. Uh, we have two search systems. One is kind of a, it's one search system, but we have two syntaxes for querying it. You can either have the low level raw structured search, which I'll show, or there's like a high level cutesy Gmail style search where you have a little operator colon value things and you can basically only do and queries. But if you're writing an app and you have some like complex needs, you can write a complex structured search with a nested JSON query, um, do whatever you want. So for instance, here we create a perma node and we search for ones tagged funny and we get nothing because maybe this is an empty, empty universe and we haven't put anything. But then we put the attribute tag funny on the one we just created and we run the search again and now we get our original perma node. So here's basically two ways to do it. Here's the little cutesy low level or the high level easy way to do it. Attribute tag is funny. Or you could do a whole JSON query. This one is doing a logical or over a search of perma nodes with tag, uh, case insensibly value equaling funny. Or you could the ones where the tag equals foo, you know, case not sensitive or sensitive. And you know finds the same thing. So our UI and stuff in our fuse layer do a lot of these raw queries. So again, here's an example of my search. Here are photos. That is the is image is an operator. And it's location Seattle, and it's before 2014. And so what's happening here is the indexer has picked out all the GPS from all my photos. And it knows the lat long of the photos. So when it's searching over all my perma nodes, it knows which ones are photos because they point to things that have the right mime type. It knows it's queried a location provider to figure out the bounds for Seattle. And it said which GPS coordinates are inside Seattle. And it knows from the date, whether the date is EXIF or file modification time or a blend of those when either one is wacky, um, which ones were before 2014. So there's a guessworks. Here's location Moscow, um, pictures of uh, basils and stuff, and Google Office. And notably, there's also a check-in here from Foursquare mixed in with the photos, because I didn't say is image there, so it found me anything in Moscow. And this node knows how to describe its location, because that check-in, which is its own perma node, is a thing that I checked in. It contains a reference to a perma node that represents that venue in Foursquare. And that venue in Foursquare has a lat long associated with it. So it knows the check-in at Google Moscow must have been in Moscow. <clears throat> or you can just say is check-in and find a bunch of check-ins. Or is check-ins in Seattle. <coughs> or is Pano. We have like cutesy operators that are just you know aliases for the width is over you know the height a certain ratio. Um, the web UI also lets you drill down into a perma node and look at its raw attributes. So here is a Foursquare check-in. You can see the Foursquare ID of that check-in, the venues perma node, uh, the start date, which is the check-in time, and the title of it from the Foursquare API. Or you can look at the raw blobs, and this is kind of what you saw in the command line tool with cam tool describe. The, the perma node, again, is just a random number. It's just some anchor that you can sign and mutate. And then you can see it the list of mutations, or these are this is the resolved uh, resolved this description of the node from the search system after resolving all the mod of, all the claims that are valid. All right, some live demos. Um, so I'm running here a empty server, and I could do things like cam tool uh, perma node or and I can just say x equals cam put perma node. And this is what you saw before with you know cam put attribute foo bar. This is more interesting. Here's the web UI for it at the same time. So here's that bar I just created.
I will say title hello. See it change to hello. Change it to bar. Change this to another title. Or I can create another permanode. Nothing happens now because we don't show permanodes that have an attribute because they're just kind of useless things that have not come into life yet. But once we give it some title, new thing, that the thing showed up there. You can also, you know, drag random photos into here. So pig, piggy ate it, and now I have a photo. And that photo, you know, you could view a photo. Let's put some more photos in there. We'll, we'll put in my beautiful table. Um, that was not beautiful. Put the piggy. We'll put in. We'll put in this dosa. Okay, so now I can you know look at some photos in a web UI if I want, and I can go look at the attributes of those. And this is a permanode where it's it's a permanode that says its content is this thingy. If I wanted to see what that thingy was. Say cam tool describe. And it says, oh, it that is a file and it's LS, you know, it was this name, this the indexer has determined it's this uh MIME type, and because it's an image, the imaging indexing system has determined it's uh those dimensions. Yeah, and I could also edit them in the UI if I wanted them, or I can you know add a title and say like some shirt, and if I go back here, oh, I guess the, the renderer and the web UI won't do that. If I can, on hover? Some shirt, yeah. And if I, you know, take that permanode, oh, I could just say permanode here, or blob, and go down and see all the mutation claims. So when I dragged it into the web UI, it said uh, set attribute commonly content, and then when I modified and said some shirt, that was a new mutation claim. Um, I could also mount the whole world. But I'll mount it at um, mount Camly. Then I can open it. So now here's a file system view. And there's like a recent directory, and this is I don't know how to make this bigger, but this is now. OSX opening it with a fused file system, so I can just read and write from this thing. In fact, I can go up a level here. I can make a root, so you could think of this as like uh, a home directory. So I'll make one called um, this new folder. Um, I'll call it home. And I can go into home. Let's go back to the web view so and see things up here. Let me go into Camly, Roots, yeah. Home, and let's write hello gg.txt into hello.txt. No. The hello.txt no, you're, you're, so, you're Oh, that was, there we go. If I open that, it's hello.txt, I can access it that way too. Well, you can't read that at all, but it says hello gg. So you can use, you know, the web. Oh, you're right. He does. But now let's say, I'm going to delete this. Delete. Well, it's still there. It still shows up in the permanode, but it's no longer in my home directory, and I'm freaking out because I've lost my data. So notice here, the time I lost it, if we look at the claims. Let's go, let's go into this Camly directory. SEA, maybe? We're talking about like the time travel. There's this magic at directory. And if you go, there's a little readme that tells you in these magic directories how they work. But you could CD into them. And so this one was created at, um, I don't know what time it is in UTC right now. If I go into like that directory. Z. The home. There's my hello.txt. Well, that was the first version of hello.txt when I added an empty file to it. But if I go back to this time, and in practice, these wouldn't be you know milliseconds apart, but uh, nine z and went into home. 
just say hello GPT. So all your data is back. You don't lose anything. So it's every every nanosecond to whatever it's effectively snapshotting. Do you ever need Git for anything? Um, the other question is, do you ever need Git for anything? Yeah, so it's useful for collaborating for people on GitHub. <laughs> but no, so. Yeah, so the question is, could you just like use this for your continual snapshotting and you know use it for your backups? But yeah, you can. It's not as efficient like packing stuff efficiently on disk. Like Camling Store's goals are more about searchability and long time archiving and stuff like that. But um, I also want to show a couple more fun demos. So this is my personal instance at home. We also have mobile support. So I am going to show a tweet. So I wrote GGG live at Camly Store demo. Well, I'm going to take a photo here uh, from from the camera. No, that's video. The camera. Everyone smile. Say hi. All right. Good enough. <laughs> yes. And so I'm tweeting, and it's sending. And I see the little upload bar on Twitter. Oh. And there it is, GDG Live CL. So there's a lot of crap that was going on right there. First of all, the tweet arrived. But meanwhile, my server at home in my garage had a long TCP connection open to, uh, to Twitter subscribing to the stream API. It saw that I posted something. It ran the importer. The importer then slurped it in, remodeled it in the Camly Store schema. So you can see these permanode properties. I found the image. This is what Twitter called the image. It put the content of the tweet, all the metadata to the Twitter ID. This is the original URL from Twitter. Um, GGG. So it keeps all the metadata that Twitter provides me. And it also created a node for it created a node for the image itself. So if I go to this, I copy and paste it right. Well, can we content image? Oh, that was the one I thought I posted. There it is. So, you know, you could download that or whatever, but there, there's the original bytes. So we have importers for currently for our sense and Adam feeds, for Flickr photos, Picasso, which is the Google Photos API, Pinboard, and Twitter. More are always welcome. These are pretty easy to write. Um, Camly Store gives you an interface that hides all the details, so you don't really have to think about like claims or perma nodes or state or resuming or scheduling. You basically just says either start afresh or iteratively update, and you could make new objects and not think about it. It handles all the crap. Meanwhile, in addition to slurping in this tweet in real time, it also I have a replication set up to sync to S3, so it also just replicated those bytes in real time and mirrored it to S3. So you should validate that all your blobs are there. And so I have, you know, I don't know how much many bytes that are. But I have a lot of crap on S3. Um, we also have an Android app. So you can actually, I mean, it would be effectively the same thing. But we'll get, we'll get this out of the room. We'll get Matthew. Wow, well, Matthew. OK. And I could do share with, I'll make sure we go back to the uh, the home here. It's share with and the Camly Store importer. And you can see the little progress bar, uploading bytes. Uh, there's a progress bar, trust me. And it's stuck right in the middle. It did that. We don't work on our Android app very much, but there it goes. <laughs> So we used to kind of have an iOS app, uh, kind of bit rot, and we had kind of an OSX app, but it was pretty much just a front end to fuse and launching the Finder, and it ran up here in the top. So if you're good at writing those sorts of things, uh, let us know. But uh, we get some questions while I remember what demos I forgot. Yep. And you have the image, and so you can change the image size. Um, actually, that no, so that um, when I looked at one of these images and I ask it to describe it, there are some attributes that are explicit. Like if I say this attribute has tag funny, 
Um, that's something subjective. I chose to have that thing. Then there are some attributes from the indexer that are just, they just are. You can't change the size of an image. That blob actually has that in the exif. Um, so you see that indexer metadata, mutation claim. Oh, I have to go to the, um, to go to the Camly content of that image. The blob. This is running out of my garage. Um, oh, here you can see that the file has more than one part. So you can see that those are all the separate chunks. It forms, you know, like a big tree, a balanced tree of stuff. And now you can see that the indexer found that the dimensions of the photo were 1,600 by 1,200. And it also indexes um, attributes from media. So like, you know, ID3 <laughs> tags and uh, video durations and stuff like that. So you could do search, you know, you could search by focal length and whatever, like show me all the photos. Yeah, so the question is bigger ambitious, what, what are our plans after this bigger ambitious wise? And I want to get to the point where uh, it kind of, not only can I store all my stuff and find all my stuff, but I want to get to the point where I can, this becomes a de facto way to store stuff. Like if I go to a site that is a tool provider, I don't have to assume that they're a storage provider at the same time. Basically, I, I hand my storage to a site and say, use this for your back end. Well, maybe they have a cache or whatever, but absolve them of the responsibility of owning my data. And I maybe somebody else hosts my Canvas server, or two or three other places host my Canvas server, and they all sync amongst themselves. And when one of them goes out of business, I find another third or I find another second. Um, then I also get to one of the point where the apps for Canvas store that you run locally are good enough tools that you could produce, manage your photos, you know, and your content, and share it with your friends without uh, centralized places. So you could have just peer-to-peer, -peer, you know, all encrypted stuff. So one thing we've been working on actually today in the hack thing was we're bringing up a DNS server for bootstrapping. So right now we have a little launcher. If you go to camlystore.org, um, you can download it if you want, but if you don't want to run your own server, the last release had this thing, chemistart.org slash launch. If you go here, you can create your own instance on GCE, and it spins up a VM running this. The problem is you don't have a DNS name. You just have an IP address. And we want to give you an automatic cert with Let's Encrypt. So it's HTTPS out of the box. But you can't get an automatic cert with Let's Encrypt unless you have a DNS name. So as part of that, we're going to give you, we're going to run a wildcard DNS server, like basically a Dyn DNS server where your subdomain is your GPG key ID. And you have to prove that, that you can sign a challenge, that you control that thing, and you control an IP address. But we'll do that out of the box for Camel Store. So anyone who goes here and says, create me an instance, and I'll pay my $5 a month, automatically has, um, is part of a big distributed hash table eventually, but it's also like has automatic SSL and stuff. And then you can alias your email addresses that are well-known identifiers, and you can make references, you could cryptographically prove that you own the email address to map to your server. And then you could find your friends by email address and existing address books and stuff and share photos to them and share directly to their server, which isn't actually in their garage like mine was, but it's like running on multiple clouds. So we're getting there. Every, every release gets a little bit further, but um, <clears throat> baby steps towards like, you know, distributed social network sort of things. It's all encrypted in your control. Yeah. Yeah, um, so the encryption is optional. Um, out of the box, if you're running on your local machine, um, it does the signing is automatic and it's on my default because it relies on the signing. But if you want to encrypt your raw blobs, there's an encrypting blob storage layer that encrypts every blob. There's like the ID at the beginning and stuff like that. And currently it's not um, on by default because I have not got a proper security audit from, I, I want to nag one of my crypto friends Verify the design. I don't trust myself enough. But, but eventually, it is the one that does the enabling. Yeah. Yeah, it's there now, but in the config file, you have to say, like, I agree and I recognize that this may not be audited or something like that. But yeah, so the, in that layer, um, I think I showed in one of the slides. Um, the encrypt one just implements the blob storage interface, get put blob, and enumerate blobs. And it keeps a little metadata on the side about every blob, what its uh, ID is, and it has your key and stuff. So it makes sure every blob has a, a unique ID. And uh, then it puts the encrypted blob. So what you do is 
you encrypt locally on your machine, and then you go put the encrypted blobs on Amazon and stuff. But when you enumerate, because they're in like a different order, you use your little index on the side to do it. And if you lose that little index on the side, you can scan all the blobs and build that index again, just like the other index. So. And you can even do things like put half your encrypted blobs here and half your encrypted blobs there. Or you can do like read Solomon these sort of things. You know, Give everyone partially encrypted blobs you need to read from two to reconstruct it, but nobody can reconstruct it on their own. Yeah, the current change for Yeah, well, assuming there are no glaring mistakes in it, it should be forwards compatible. And it's always it's always pretty easy if like we change the index format, it's pretty easy to re-index. There's a mode you say cam store d dash dash re-index, or you could say cam tool, what is it, cam tool sync dash dash all or re-index, and it reads from your blob store. Basically the way indexing works is indexing is another another just blob storage target that doesn't implement get, only implement store. And you put the blob to the storage target, and it looks at things and records things in the index, and it supports another interface. So um, it's just another replication target. Brett, what about this has got all the arrows here with the sync of the blobs? What about sharing the blobs? Or not even sharing oh, yeah, we didn't talk about sharing at all. Um, so yeah, there was this share here. I don't really have any slides. Um, so one thing you could do, let's go back to uh, the list. So we're in this cam we store directory. This is just the project itself. I'm going to put uh, the documentation directory. And the documentation directory, if I can't get this, is this as a directory. But I can also say can put share transitive that. And what that does is it creates a new it creates a new claim signed by me. We can look at that. And get. And that claim says that whoever can authenticate with type have ref, which is basically no authentication, like you have this token, like it's like a bearer token. You have access to this object transitively and everything reachable from that. So I can give this to somebody else, and then they can mount that and fetch and fault in the blobs from my server on demand. So if I pull up a incognito tab, and I go to a Camly house, uh, ES Camly, that, and don't authenticate. What is it? Share. Uh, what is the URL? Do you remember? Imagine it works. <laughs> is it is it can get shared something? Anyway, it's been a while since we worked on this. But you give this out to somebody and then they could transitively reach all the other blobs and they the client presents the path uh, through this thing. And what we're working on after this is being able to share a search query. So if I go out hiking with somebody, I can give them access to all my photos from this phone for the next hour, even if they haven't been taken yet. And later, they can go back and send that search query to my server and get the photos from my thing that appeared you know, after that point. So. When you share, does it include the metadata? Yeah, so the question is, uh, does it include the metadata? Again, there's no kind of difference between metadata and, and data. So if I get this and look at the target, the target of that is a directory. So there's metadata in there about the directory. And then if I get the next hop, like the entries, this is what like you know your fuse file system would be doing behind the scenes. You get, oh, those are the those are the files in the thing. And if I get one of those, uh, that is an Emacs backup file called environment text tilde. And if I get this one, there's a description of the environment variables and can for debugging. So yeah, so they get they get the metadata and the data. Is there a revoke? Yes. Yeah. The question is, is there a revote? Revoke? Um, we can actually show a live demo of that. Okay. Let's go to uh, the local one here. So let's for instance um, say that this is a really stupid picture, and we want to delete this. From the public, but not from your own. Well, yeah, you can revoke the share, for sure. 
but I will show you also how deletes work. So on this photo here, there was a claim that um, this permanode equaled this attribute here, this Camly content. And that claim was this blob ref. Um, sure. uh, if I get that one, that is a claim setting it to this attribute. Now let's say we don't like that anymore. So what is it? I could say input delete that. Notice that photo just went away over there. So what, what that actually did was it did a new claim, claim delete, and it deleted the claim. So that other claim, ignore that. That was a mistake. It's still there in the history if I go back. You can see your past mistakes. But now I can actually delete that delete. So I'm going to delete the delete, and now the photo's back. So it's, you know, there could be a whole tree of deletes and negating deletes. Yeah, apparently there's a UI for this. And you can um, you know, select, select, and there's like delete items over here and update tags. Or you can like create a new set. Let's create a new set of settings. Give that thing a title, title, and a fix. Yeah, I just created an album. And then the question is, yes, you created a photo album. How do you publish this on your website? So one thing we've been working on is apps lately. And the idea with an app is that you can run a child process in like a container. Of, you know, it's like, and then that process can run totally isolated and have access to a subset of your data. So it can write things, and it can read things that it wrote, and it can delete things that it wrote, but it can't get out of its little namespace and access other blobs. But in your master UI, which itself is just an app, but it's an app in like a parent container, it can see all of your blobs and objects. So uh, a little bit like Sandstorm, I guess, in that respect. Slightly different models. Uh, yeah. So if you were running this thing with Git, yeah. um, does this produce a blob that you checked in whenever you have a Git commit? Or what, what would that look like? If the question is, if I were running this with Git, what would it look like to whom? To well, I'm concerned that if you have a systems that are frequently uh, small edits. And files oh yeah. And, uh, yeah. So it's really start figuring out. On the yeah. The question is, like, if you run Git or something that does lots of operations on the file system, what will it do to this? It will. And the answer is it will store everything and duplicate everything, and it'll massively blow it up. So this is more of like a long-term archival mechanism. It's not supposed to be like a, a competitor to like ButterFS or ZFS or something like that. So I probably wouldn't make it my home directory. I would snapshot to it or rsync to it or something, but I wouldn't use it for my interactive like development. Although you could. Um, and we probably could do some optimizations to coalesce some of those like, dummy little operations. And we do have a, a equivalent to like a Git ignore file for like files we don't need to do, but I don't think we respect it in the fuse layer. We only respect it in the the camp hook kind of snapshot layer. We we have a command line tool to like copy this whole directory into Camly store, and that respects like ignore my Emacs backup files, and ignore this directory, ignore my caches directory, and stuff like that. But the fuse layer probably, like, if we go into that Camly roots home, um, let's, I don't know, see self project you up over there. I can go into this and say git init. And <laughs> so there's a bunch of crap, right? So we need to do some work on making our default search view be like maybe a different query. Because right now we just don't like show me everything. And um, when you use this as your home directory, that's probably like not a search operator you want. Maybe the default is, you know, is not crap and just see your photos or something. That's just is image. But so it works, but there's there's a cost. I guess if you essentially have the adding button from the Yeah, yeah. And if you decide to, um, so one workflow I like is I just take all my photos, sync them at all times, and I keep every version of everything. 
But then like the subsets I share with some people versus the subset I put on the web are all different subsets. And it doesn't matter if I have 20 folders with different subsets because it's all deduped. And the incremental cost to have another view of some subset of files is just a couple of K or one K of metadata. So um, it's really cheap to do like folder management in this. When you searched through the Seattle fix, you, you relied on the XFX for timestamp and the location. Yeah. If the images didn't have the XFX tag, um, then the mud Yes, okay, that's a great question. It says when I like did a search for location in Seattle, it relied on XIF. Um, it did rely on XIF currently for this one, uh, but this one, it knew from Foursquare has that metadata about that check-in. One thing we're also working on is correlating for when we don't have explicit information, inferring it from other sources. So like I'm recording all my um, GPS position. I know like for instance, I checked in here you know, n minutes ago, I probably didn't move far from that, right? So you can infer that this photo was also from me and that one is from me, so it's probably I didn't go far. Or I'm recording all my uh, location history using uh, the Google location vault or whatever. And so we're going to slurp all that in. And then I'm also going to be slurping in like my run keeper data, so all my runs. So if I take a photo, or here's a great example is I'm on a run, I see something pretty, I tweet it with a photo, but I don't put on the sharing on the Twitter tweet. But I'm in the middle of a run, so I'm recording GPS anyway. So I have one event that spans this time with precise GPS at every second, and I have a tweet right in the middle of it. So I know the location of the tweet because it was along a line that I recorded. So I can actually, well, I can't do it in this little box, but in theory, I can do a uh, query that says, show me all photos that happened with one hour of a check-in of a venue of type nightclub or bar. So I could basically find all my drunk photos with like cross-correlating stuff between data sources. And this is something that Foursquare can't give me, Google Photos can't give me, because they both don't have all the data, but I have all the data. So, yeah. So in the interest of like preserving you know, things forever, uh, or if they're gone, um, you, what about asking for the end and have like, like if you're an app to the user, and the app can tell you what you're in the camera store, yeah, the, the question is about like uh, apps and apps to be run in Camly Store and you know, how do you uh, preserve those. Um, to some degree you have to like think of this when you create the data about is this going in a format that is like an open format or whatever. But yes, going forward we would like to have apps that are like Camly Store and stuff and think of the Camly Store data model when they're written. And we're starting to write a couple. There's one called Publish that well, it doesn't create data, but it exports your existing data from Camel Store and lets you publish a static website with stuff. So you manage all your photos, you select some ones, and you would like to put them on the web. And you configure it a host name and path. And it will basically speak HTTP on one side and serve your static thumbnails out and read only and read it out of Camel Store. That's an app that runs in this like kind of framework we're building. The other one is I had a document management system that I wrote years ago. Yeah. Yeah. The the question is, you might want to store like the binary itself in a portable way. So you could imagine um, pick, compiling something to you know native client or you know Pinnacle or HTML WebAssembly or something or like. If, if you think of like portable bytecode formats that are probably going to be emulatable in 40, 50 years, x86 is a pretty good bet. So you have a, a static Go binary that doesn't use libc or whatever, and uh, you know the, our, the Wayback Machine is going to have copies of the Linux kernel in the system call interface, so that is something that will be emulatable. So I'm not really worried if we can emulate every old machine currently. I think the most popular machine in existence will be emulatable in the future. So yeah, we can we can keep the binaries in some form, whether it's Pinnacle or WebAssembly or x86 static binaries, and run them in a you know C group container or whatever. One question. So pretty much around here, this quantity is worth space. Should we be putting a camera store on the rockets so that the dust might have blown up the Storage and space. I don't know. Latency does suck. So, I don't know. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So, I what's some of the velocity in the store? I've heard like it's connected with 
Uh, I've never used plan nine. Um, this guy likes plan nine and uses Acme. He acts on Family Store, but uh, yeah. So there's there's prior art for lots of this stuff in bits and pieces. I think the only kind of unique thing that Camry Store brings in terms of like state of the art is our permanode data model of mutations. A lot of things like Venti and um, other file systems did the kind of the Merkle tree checksums of stuff. A lot of that you also see in Git and Git's data model with like objects and trees and reps and stuff. So uh, by nine, no, I don't know. I guess it's all, a lot of this is written in Go. Almost all of it these days is written in Go. And a lot of the Go, early Go people are kind of Plan 9 inspired in terms of simplicity and stuff. So the code base is very simple. Can you share something that other people can edit? Can you share? OK, so currently the question is, can you share things that other people can edit? The answer is not yet. We've been putting that off until um, Every release, we try to focus on something, and we put off the sharing release for a while, but it's coming up. It's probably our next one. This is why we're working on the DNS server and like kind of the addressing. But the design has been there from the beginning. So when you create a permanode, um, cam put permanode, permanode, and I look at one of these things. The reason, I mean, there's a random number. So you need a random number. That is not the right one. <laughs> there we go. So now I have a permanent node, and has a random number, whatever. Um, but the, the interesting thing here is that it has an owner. The person who signs this random number is the owner, and the indexer will only respect mutations by the owner. So somebody else could make a mutate to this, and maybe I slurp in their content for whatever reason. Maybe they tricked me into slurping it in. Um, they say, hey, here's a backup. Here's some files. Here, maybe they say, here's my photos of the trip, and they give me a zip, and the zip has this in it, and I end up storing a, a claim of theirs that's signed by them. It would be bad if my indexer looked at their claim and maybe changed the, tried to look like it was me and changed the permission of something else or injected a photo into my repo I didn't want. Um, so the key part of this is the indexer only respects changes to this permanode that are also by the signer. And everything else is just considered noise, unless I modify. Yeah, unless the signature is verified. But if I want to let other people mutate this, I can make uh, act, I can make a mutation on this, changing the actles, and tell the world, and tell other people's indexers and my indexer that you should also respect this person's edits, or revoke that, or whatever. So you can have multiple signatures. Uh, yeah, you'll be able to have mutations signed by different people. Yeah, like an engineer. Potentially, yeah, and you know maybe eventually we do the whole like um, operational transform thing and let people do live edits on things. Um, I don't know, but the the plan is there, but we haven't implemented things yet. This is what you meant by by yeah. Yeah, the question is is this about the vision of like multiple users in the end? Yeah, but once we get to like you know. The kind of distributed social network thing. You want multiple people leaving comments on photos and you know, likes and stuff. So you can imagine there's a like claim, and someone likes this photo, so they send my server a blob that I can accept and it's signed by them. They say I like this. Then I have cryptographic cryptographic proof they liked it, not just account. But that's good because if I'm hosting it and mirroring it, other people can verify that like claim. And I wasn't inflating my crap. So. You also, you know, do the whole web trust thing and see those or spam bots liking your crap and no one likes them. Uh, is there a way to completely remove everything? Um, I could server. <laughs> so oh, that's that's the right one. All gone. No results sound sad. Thing. <laughs> well, this this is running on my local machine. So, I mean, if I wanted to delete my one at home, I would, you know, go hit all my home disks with hammers, and I would delete the S3 bucket and delete my crypto keys and stuff. Are there any interesting blockchain applications you thought about? Are there interesting blockchain applications I've thought about? Um, yeah, there. 
there are fun things like what IPFS is doing with uh, storage or you know uh, storage coin sort of thing um, about like having people host your mirrors of data and you can do validations that they actually have your stuff. And, uh, I was thinking about focusing on that for a while, but then um, every cloud provider keeps dropping their prices faster. So I'm always less motivated to work about reducing storage costs when everyone is doing it for me. But that is something I would like to do someday. Yep. Um, yeah, you want to make a video? It should work. Um, okay. So that should give me a file. Share with Family Store. Well, this one's bigger, but it's uploading. It should work. Um, leave it here. Oh, yeah. Um, all these files, even if they're small, are cut up in a little chunk, so it's like efficient to see to any point and stuff. This, uh, the chunk size varies. Um, the beginning, the first chunk is generally bigger because we looked at access patterns from like Nautilus and OSX Finder and stuff about what they do for leaving the thumbnails to the access. So the first chunk is like 256K. Then after that, they tend to be statistically around 64. We don't cut on fixed sizes because we do the rolling check something and try to find the patterns to cut on. But um, did, it, did it go? It said uploaded. Is the location Seattle? Oh, you're right. There might not be. There it is. So there's a video. So we, we index it enough to do things like that and duration and things like that. We could probably do more. Um, no, because there's. The question is, would encryption mess up the rolling checksum? No, because the cutting is done by your server before it's encrypted. And the metadata to describe the Merkle tree is also encrypted, but that is in the root. So you get that, decrypt it, then you know all your offsets. And you know those uh, those then point to the unencrypted blob refs. But then you look at your little side table to figure out what the ID is for those ones. And then you can figure out what the blob ref of the encrypted version of that unencrypted blob is. And you go fetch that from your untrusted cloud provider and then decrypt it locally and serve the bytes. This is all handled you know, transparently by whatever layer. What if you could talk a little bit about the meta project as, as an open source project, how the community has um, come together around it, what is the kind of community lens, how the evolution of the project? Oh, OK, yeah, the question is about the community and meta about the project and the history of the project. Uh, the history is I had written subsets of this project a dozen times and I got sick of rewriting it every time because it always felt like the same project with a slightly different angle. So I wanted to build this and I kept thinking of ideas of like how I wanted the data model. And then one day I was talking with a uh, coworker Brett Slack and, and I think we finally figured out like the permanent thing, how we wanted the you know the crypto and stuff to work. And uh, but it's kind of stuck there for maybe a year in my head. I just didn't want to build it because it seemed like such an epic pain in the ass to build it all. And at the time, I was working in Mountain View and living in San Francisco, and the commute was getting worse and worse. And I was working on Android at the time on the Android team in Mountain View. And on Android, the build system is terrible, and you need really giant machines. And when you're sitting on the bus for like three hours a day in traffic, you don't have this like 24 core machine with like gigabytes of RAM. So I had to you know, hack on something on my laptop. And so I wanted to build this, but I didn't want to build it in Java because I got enough Java at work. And I didn't want to build it in C++ because C++ is painful everywhere outside of Google that has a good build system and a good library. And I didn't want to build it in a scripting language because I'd wasted enough of my life on scripting languages. And so uh, at the time, Go had just come out. And so I said, well, I'll get my feet wet and try it in Go. And so I kind of fell in love with Go. And so I worked on this for maybe a year before, while I was still on the Android team, just on the bus to and from work, and um, had a lot of fun with it. The good thing about Go is you can write 
low level code when you want to write low level code, but most of the time you could write high level code. And it feels like a scripting language, but it's fast, like C. Um, so I did that, you know, made it a project, and then I joined the Go team officially. And they said, you know, just work on this, because whenever you work on this, you make the Go standard library and stuff better. So a lot of the, uh, the Go standard library was born out of this. Um, yeah, so they kind of co evolved. And every time there's a new release of Go, we immediately, like that day, switch our minimum requirement for Camly Store to be the, the just released version of Go. Because a lot of the, the, you know, yeah, they evolve at the same time. And I don't know. Uh, we have docs of like contributing, and some contributors have come and gone, and some dabble for a while and come back. And uh, Mathieu here from France, he uh, he's been working on it for like years and years. So it's about it's about six years old, and there's docs about how to contribute. And what? You're snickering up there in the front row. I assume he's always Mathieu. He's Mathieu from France. <laughs> Je n'ai pas la Um I don't know if that was enough of an answer. Yeah. Um, the question is, do I see it becoming a real product? And I guess that depends on a Google product. Uh, no, I don't think so. Um, I don't really have any aspirations of making it one, and I'm not sure. I mean, I, maybe you can align it with some sort of like Google takeout or own your data initiative, but. Um, I think it's fine on its own. I don't know. I kind of don't want it to be a Google product in that uh, I think people have enough fear of big companies and data centralization that I think it's kind of better a little bit on the side, um, you know, skeptically on the side of it. It likes to use all these cloud products, but at the same time, Family Store is naturally uh, paranoid about all centralization and companies and stuff. Because companies come and go, protocols survive, data formats survive. So people ask me why I still use like email to share photos. I'm like, well, SMTP's had a good run and it's still kicking and the SMTP company hasn't turned down yet. Yep. Uh, the question is what attributes are supported or well, what file? No, I don't. I don't think this layer exists. Um, basically, all the layers are the only ones. I basically said there's blob storage, and then there's recommended schemas for popular sorts of things. And if you're not happy with the schemas we provide, you can make your own. Um, in some cases, you'll have to teach the indexer to answer questions that things we didn't index. And the plan is probably to make the indexer more pluggable in the future if we don't want to put some specific type of indexing in the core. But generally, you express everything with permanodes, and you set arbitrary attributes on them, and you query on arbitrary attributes, and the search system is totally flexible in that regard. So without modifying the Camelot Store core, you can model anything you want however you want and search it however you want. Um, sometimes that's not as efficient if then if like 
maybe you wanted to support, like we don't support Excel files, like spreadsheet files natively. Maybe we could, and maybe we could teach the indexer how to read those, and you could do searches to say, show me everything with you know something at cell E3 having this value. Um, we could do that, and it would be more efficient to just store the XLS bytes and have the indexer tell me that answer. Or you could model the spreadsheet as bazillions of permanodes and values and relationships between them all, but that would be many more objects and much more storage. And so it's always kind of like whenever there's a new data type model, we have this whole discussion on like the spectrum. Like the other day we were discussing um, how are we going to store like run keeper runs you know, with GPS logs, especially when it's a GPS log for your life. Is that, is that one permanode, which is my position, and it just has a mutation every second for my whole life? Or is it there, are there like segment objects? Are there like track objects? But what is a segment? Is it like a daily segment? Is it whenever there's movement? Um, so we're still debating how to model that one properly. A lot of times it's more obvious. Sometimes it's not obvious. But. Uh, the question is, is there any fuse-like capability for Windows? Uh, the answer there used to be. Um, we had a WebDAV server that spoke to the same layer that the fuse layer talked to. We have this like file system abstraction uh, in Go that like presents a file system interface on top of permanodes. And the fuse layer talks to that. And we had a WebDAV interface, and you can go in, uh, you can mount a WebDAV thing in Windows. It looked like a native Z colon drive or whatever. And it worked a bit rot, and now there are multiple people interested in resurrecting it. And apparently other people have worked on better web dabby things. So. Oh yeah, I did see that. So we, we have um, on GitHub, Camly Store, Camly Store issues, like a Windows label. Um, use Dokken, Dokken, is this one? Yeah. So yeah, June 14th, 2003. So we want to bring it back. If you want to help, please help. Yeah, it did work at one time, but I, I don't regularly use Windows, so. actually have a working scale, just a matter of how much that Yeah, there's a big one on our Garrett code review. Um, web dev. Rewrite cam web dev based on FS and Golang XNet web dev. So this is a giant CL and it just hasn't received proper review love despite lots and lots of discussion about the CL. So uh, it doesn't look like a ton of code. 64 lines there, modifications to our file system layer, debugs. I don't know. I haven't looked at it. That you should look at it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. The the list is not very extensive at the time. Um, importers. These are the ones that are built into the server. Um, so RSS and added feeds, Flickr, Foursquare, the Swarm, uh, Picasso, just Google Photos, um, Pinboard, and Twitter. And there's a run keeper one in the works for importing run data. But if you want to write one, I mean, and you know some other sites API, it's pretty easy to write them. You just iterate over all the thingies you made on the site and slurp them down one by one, or first see if they exist in Camly Store first, and if they're different and all. If they're different, make the mutations to Camly Store. I mean, I could show uh, one of the importers as kind of an example. Uh, uh, OAuth isn't even too bad. Uh, package importer as a Twitter. Twitter to go. Um, there's like run method and set up some OAuth crap, and you get like there's a perma node that represents uh, that importer account. So if I go into, like, for instance, my Twitter account, you can set up multiple accounts on Twitter that you're archiving if you have multiple identities or something. And you can see your accounts. 
And you can see that the account itself has a metadata node, so you can go look at. This is the perma node that represents my Twitter account for importing purposes. Um, I will not show my OAuth. Well, I showed my OAuth access token. Ho hopefully, hopeful oh, you didn't say anything. Um, yeah. And you can see the root, and the root is an object. The, the importer system gives you your account node with all your metadata about your OAuth stuff, and then it also gives you your root node, and you can put whatever, whatever you want in the root node. And in this case, I just put a folder called Brad Fitz's tweets in the root node, which is itself a perma node, which just has all my tweets underneath of it. And each one of those could have other things. So. Not that. Bloodysearch.com. That's full text indexing and search for Go. And they have a really nice API with the right abstractions and places for, to plug it in. So we'll drop this in and also support full text indexing and search for email. So then we'll make like an IMAP importer that can keep your keep a mirror of your Gmail in your family store. Uh, the question, have I looked at something of you pass? No, I, did, I haven't heard of it. You, you pass? Email? Okay. You dub, you pass. Um, I had a you pass back in the day. Uh, a simpler approach to network mail. Oh, by Presotto. Yeah, I used to sit next to him. Um, so, yeah, email one day. Full text indexing is a chore, but it sounds like some of the other, other people have done it for us. So. Cool. I think we're done then. Thank you.